The Himalayas have always seemed eternal to those who reflect and those who dream. But the roof of the world, Sagarmatha, the head of the sky for the Nepalese, reveals itself to be more sensitive than the rest of the planet to the influence of global warming. The rising of temperatures is eight times faster here than anywhere else, and the high glacier, the planet's water castle, retreats year after year. Nepal, sandwiched between the two giants of the Asian continent, India and China, is the most visually contradictory country in the world. In less than 200 kilometers, we pass the altitude of 100 meters to over 8,000 meters. In the village of Ghat, situated at 2,800 meters above sea level, Norbu Sherpa was born 47 years ago. Over several generations, his family has lived at the banks of the river Dud Koshi that descends from the peaks of the Himalayas into the Khumbu Valley in the east of Nepal. Like all the members of the Sherpa tribe, Norbu does many activities. But above all, he is a mountain guide with several snowy treks up the Everest under his belt. But he is also a hotel and restaurant owner, as well as a farmer. At the edge of the mountainous trails, he has a traditional lodge where passing tourists can take a break and get a hot meal. This hard-working life creates the link between the traditional people and cosmopolitan tourists born from globalization. Apparently serene, these places still resonate with the brutal consequence of global warming. Norbu Sherpa was a direct victim. Not only did he see the land change, he watched it collapse under his feet. On that day, I was at home with my family. Suddenly, I heard a hell of a noise. Everyone went outside to see what it was. The sound was apocalyptic. And there, there we saw, it was like a mountain rushing towards us. The height of the wave was 20 meters high. Who would believe that the little clear streams could brutally transform to a wall of water capable of destroying the valley beneath its torrent? The danger was lurking 3,000 meters higher at the foot of the high glaciers. In Nepal, the glaciers have become a concern. They are monitored as limited resources by a community of glaciologists from the eight countries surrounding the Himalayan chain. The uniting organization, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, based in Kathmandu, at the moment can only publish mostly negative data. In the Himalayas, when we look at the glaciers, we can see that they are slowly disappearing. I'll give you an example. In the Khumbu Valley, there are many glaciers. They have already retreated by one kilometer. When the glaciers advance, they push tons of land and stones. This is what we call moraines. When the glaciers begin to melt, the moraines that have accumulated in the past retain water like a natural dam. From that moment on, the water retained begins to form a basin. In Nepal, around 1,600 lakes have formed now. And one day, the water pressure will become so that the dam can no longer support it and they risk giving way. In the Himalayas, this happens many times. On August 4, 1985, 20 kilometers upstream from Ghat, the Dig Cho Lake broke the moraine that held it. 10 million cubic meters of water, rocks, 
ice and debris were all released in a flash. The huge tidal wave descended the valley in about 40 minutes, creating a gully that cut the walls. In Gat, the banks of the river collapsed and created holes over a dozen meters wide. It engulfed the village, the inns, and the temple. Many unfortunate people were grabbed by the monster and still remain unaccounted for. They simply disappeared. The next day, when we came back to look, we saw that the house was torn from its foundations. The only things that remained were pieces of beams and roof. On that day, below, there were eight houses that were taken by the mudslide. At the spot where I am, there was a house that was destroyed and two others a little further. Including mine, that makes four more that were washed away. But you see, all these tragedies, whether due to wind, fire, flooding, all this is due to karma. It is customary here to say that with karma, there is only one thing you can do, you must suffer. During my life, nature has never been nice to me. It has created a lot of difficulties. I had plans for my life and nature turned them upside down. Like all the members of the Sherpa tribe, Norbu was born Buddhist. The symbolic and mystical signs that surround his home demonstrate the depth of his family's religious roots. Norbu's ambition was to become a lama in the temple which was destroyed by the tidal wave. His parents found themselves penniless, and the young monk had to give up his vocation and preoccupy himself with money matters. But once prosperity came, Norbu rebuilt the temple, where he celebrates the rituals himself. If this flood did not happen, I would have without a doubt pursued more in-depth studies to become a lama. I would not have felt obligated to become a guy. If I could have undertaken those studies, I would have, without a doubt, attained an educational level a lot higher. It is not that I wanted to become a Lama, but I wanted to follow an intellectual and philosophical path of a very high level. My idea was to educate the villagers, and I would have really liked to educate young lamas. All that I believe, that I wish to do, gone. Nothing remains. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Today, the brutality of that catastrophe and other effects of climate change weighs on the daily life of Norbu and his wife. To put food on the table, they can only rely on their fields, but the rhythms of the seasons have gone wild. In the past, in October or November, we were supposed to protect our harvest because the cold would destroy them. Now we can grow vegetables all year round including in winter. Yes, but it is chaotic because sometimes there are some years that it rains so much that we can barely leave this house. On the other hand, last year we had such a drought that the earth where we put the potatoes transformed into sand. The potatoes grew in a chaotic manner. Then there were large ones that grew and small ones that remained stunted and did not. And so when it comes time to harvest, it was then that the rain began to fall and everything rotted and it becomes unusable. 
So you understand that with the varying seasons like this, we cannot have a worthwhile harvest of potatoes, whereas before, we were self-sufficient. <laughs> the management of the lunch table is a constant puzzle for Kandu, who manages the reserves, which are dwindling year after year. Their stock is limited to two cows, which provide them with the needed daily milk. But it has become impossible to expand their herd, as the pastures are becoming drier and drier. In addition, Norbu's father, who gave up being a mountain guide, is now a burden to his children. The mills and prayer flags, the lupkas, are there to multiply to infinity the invocations he murmurs to the gods. After having led many expeditions, my father has turned toward meditation. And when he dedicated his life to Lamaism, he completely detached himself from family life. Tourism has allowed the Sherpas to considerably improve their way of life but it has caused collateral damage that has almost become irreversible. Fifteen years ago, the forests of the Sagarmatha National Park had been reduced to virtually nothing. The trunks were used as beams for the lodges and the branches used as fuel. This illegal deforestation was vigorously opposed by the habitants themselves. The trees were replanted with the help of the community. The young trees have found their roots in the soil and have made the Kumbu Valley, once menaced by desertification, a little greener. Planting trees was something the locals could do, but using civil engineers necessary to reinforce the dangerous glacier lakes would cost several million dollars and that is an amount that the state cannot afford. The young person responsible for the Sagarmatha National Park can't contain his anger. The whole world's media is very preoccupied with the global warming situation in the Himalayas, but ultimately, it would be more useful if our own government would take things into their hands and deal with the serious issues. An environmental ministry group is appointed here. It had proposed a magnificent program, but nothing concrete has been done yet. In Copenhagen, the large countries like India and the United States have sent 25 representatives each. And us, our small country, we sent out six. And so with all the people here, what have they done? Instead of whining and doing nothing, it would have been more useful, for example, to bring a generator and empty the lake. The draining could have been monitored by the locals and would finally be more effective. Norbu wants to escape the irrational worries and the unfounded rumors. He leaves Gat for the small neighboring airport, where the taxi plane departs for Kathmandu. Norbu wants to question the scientists to know the causes and the consequences of global warming. In flight, Norbu realizes that the first part of the question is answered by nature itself. At 2,500 meters, the mountain remains green but as we return to the lowland, the drought is made even more apparent. Sri Govind Shah is an agronomist at the University of Kathmandu. He has observed the same phenomena as Norbu, but on a larger scale in all of Nepal. For him, the agricultural zones surrounding the capital are in great danger. In Nepal, it is clear that in the past few years, global warming has a significant presence. 
We see the changes in temperature. For example, in Kathmandu, 40 or 50 years ago, we were wearing sweaters for the Dasan celebration, held in September-October. Today, the people go around in shirts. The temperature rises, but it changes with season two. Previously, it would rain in June and July. Now it has a tendency to shift more towards August. Before, we would have a winter harvest. But with the sudden change in temperatures and the mismatched rainfall, we now know that the harvest is a lot less abundant. Before, crops that would grow at 3,000 meters now grow at 4. On the other side, we see melting glaciers, but we see snow that progressively diminishes. Therefore, finally, we are getting more and more used to seeing a bare mountain. Climatic imbalances have also led to an exodus to the capital, more and more exposed to the effects of overpopulation. When people settle on the land suitable for agriculture, the people develop and conquer the agricultural land. In this way, the area of arable land surface has a tendency to diminish. Today, the land is split between residential areas and paddy fields so that water can no longer come. The rice paddies and fields are invaded by concrete. Well, a little bit of land remains, as you can see here. But this land that you see will soon be colonized by houses. In the town of Kathmandu, it is even clearer. In 30 years, the capital's population has gone from 235,000 inhabitants to over 3 million. Driven off their land by drought, floods, and a deadly guerrilla war that lasted more than 15 years, farmers in the Terai Plain have become refugees in a city where nothing was planned to accommodate them. Every day, thousands of candidates invade the sidewalks in front of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, hoping for a visa to the Gulf countries. This demographic explosion has resulted in exponentially increasing pollution. The atmosphere is stifling. For housing, the people accept anything, anywhere. The slums are spreading like wildfire on the banks of the Bagmati River. They dump their waste all over, like the majority of the town. All the unhealthy water retentions form areas for insect-carrying parasites. Global warming, combined with human promiscuity, has exposed cases of waterborne diseases, such as malaria, cholera, or dengue fever. In the few clinics, doctors worry about the effects of this phenomena on the health of the population. These practitioners see new infections that invite themselves to the table with common diseases. Sachin Buju has an office in a popular area of Kathmandu. Every day, he is in constant alarm. The stomach, it really burns me, especially at night. It feels like shooting pains on the side. Now, not only here in Kathmandu, but also in other cities of superior altitude, which can reach 1,500 meters, we are beginning to see cases of malaria. That has changed over time, too. Before, we saw mosquitoes in March and April. Now we see them appear in the region in the months of January and February. 
In the past, we would see two or three cases per year. Now we see more than six a month. New diseases that didn't exist in the past, like the dengue, make an appearance in the country, and that is due to global warming. Therefore, it is evident that the water-based diseases are developing here today. Kathmandu, that was once so beautiful, symbolizes the degeneration of his country for Norbu. With each visit, he no longer recognizes the places that were familiar a few months before. The city is deteriorating even faster than the mountains. On the site of the cremation rituals, Pashupati, where the Hindus come to say their final farewell to their loved ones, nothing seems to have changed for centuries. And yet, this was a sacred river, alive and clear. About 15 years ago, its current would take the ashes of cremations up to the Ganges. Today, the Bagmati River is nothing more than a putrid channel where the children innocently splash and where the undertakers paddle in coffins. In this crowd of diversity, the population of the town does not seem preoccupied with the people in the mountains. Norbu seems more and more alone to face his questions. Bupesh Adhikari, a climatologist at the University of Kathmandu, tries to bring him some answers. When I go to the Himalayas, I quite often see what appear to be large black streaks in the snow. I've heard this from many people. What we can see when we are in the air, even if it's not visible to the naked eye, is a lot of dust. These particles are a lot finer even than a simple hair, and even if we do not see it, it profoundly affects our environment. Yes, it's very pretty, all this, but the glacial lakes, we've been told, are becoming more and more dangerous, and I have the impression that the Nepalese government is not proposing a solution. They are happy to ring the alarm bell, though. That only tells us that if you want to protect yourselves, you have to flee. Are the specialists capable of telling us, this day you will be in danger and you will have to evacuate? Or are we given the non-verified information in bulk? The ones that mask the incompetence and mismanagement. Oh, for me, as you know, it's not my specialty. There are other specialists that are able to tell you if a lake is at the point where the dams will overflow. I can only tell you that there is dust in the air and if it has the tendency to move towards the Himalayas. Norbu no longer hopes to get answers for solutions from the Nepalese scientists. The initiatives should have come politically, but Gagan Tapa, a young elected politician, has no such illusions. Nepal as a nation does not have the necessary capabilities to overcome a problem of such magnitude. But as we have not received help from developed countries, on our behalf, we cannot do anything big to begin the work. When China or India is interested in environmental issues, they consider the small countries, Nepal, Maldives, Bhutan and Bangladesh, like negligible entities. But they are, despite it all, the donators, and we should behave nicely towards them. <laughs> For now, the state of Nepal can do nothing but ask for help. But this democracy that is only three years old does not even imagine the means to fight. 
No political party has the slightest interest in the environment ministry. Now we are committed to have a program by 2015, but for months we did not have a ministry of environment here. In Nepal, it is considered a punishment to be the environmental minister. As long as the people do not embrace this problem, and they do not pressure the politicians to force them to act, then the political parties profit from their votes, for their own benefits, without worrying about the environmental questions. Disappointed by the lack of response from the men of Kathmandu, Norbu went home to Ghat and sought refuge in the solitude of his temple. But deep down, he knows that although the ritual practices calm him, it does not solve the dangers from the mountains. In the valley, it is said that another glacial lake is threatening to explode. But take, for example, the case of Imja Lake. In 1960, this lake did not exist. So between 1960 and 2011, there has been an appearance of a lake that today is two kilometers long. Its maximum depth reaches 100 meters. If Lake Imja broke its dams, we know that between 1,000 and 1,500 people will be in danger. These 1,500 people live exclusively on tourism. Every year, more than 25,000 trekkers walk the paths that go towards the massive Everest, where the number of glacial lakes increases year after year. Merchandise and materials get to the lodges on the backs of men or animals. Taking loads of more than 60 kilograms up these steep and narrow passageways is a common activity for these women and men. But their lives are more uncertain, at the whim of an uncertain lake. In the area, there are 25 or 26 glacial lakes that are potentially dangerous. If these lakes reach the same level as Lake Imja, they could explode one day. Norbu has heard that the Japanese scientists have installed measuring instruments and alerts on Lake Imja. He decided to go see for himself if the strangers have succeeded where the state of Nepal did not. Normally, the Sherpas do not go up the high mountain alone. The lake is situated at more than 5,500 meters, and up there, the slightest incident could be fatal. As with every dangerous expedition, Norbu invokes the god and goddesses of the mountain. For Norbu, the Kong Duri is a welcome gateway on the path leading to the glacial lake after several days of walking alone. When I first began as a mountain guide, I would organize the trekking expeditions. We had to carry on our back a lot of equipment to fight against the cold. We needed a lot of isothermic clothing. But since global warming, we can contend to now go with only a small lightweight backpack. In the past, when we wanted to visit the Everest base camp, we needed a three or four day walk to get there. But now, as there is no more snow, it is easier. I can join the base camp in only one day walking. The last step before the high mountain is Namchi Bazaar situated at 3,000 meters above sea level. In this little village, clinging to the mountainside, the vegetation gains ground little by little. In the past, it was covered in snow in the same season. Like on every visit, 
Norbu visits Kancha Sherpa. The old man is the last surviving team member that accompanied Edmund Hillary in the first expedition to conquer Everest. This is Hillary, the leader of the expedition. And here, that is me, right next to Sherpa Tenzing. And there, those are the other Sherpas. Norbu likes to visit the old man, since the childhood memories flood him with a past that will never return. My parents had a small house. It did not have access to the river. And so when we needed water, it was enough to open the window and we would take the snow that was on the edge. After several days' walk, Norbu arrives at Tang Bosch Buddhist Monastery at 3,800 meters of altitude. The plateau that it was built on is only 20 kilometers from Everest. This monastery is the flagship of Tibetan Buddhism that permeates the Sherpa culture. It is the largest and most prestigious monastery of Khumbu. Norbu goes back to the monastery where he studied when he was a young monk. He was Ujen Dorjis's student, a Tibetan Lama. Norbu remained marked by the teachings of his mentor. We worship the gods. We pray monthly and annually. And we regularly burn incense. We worship the gods, Kumbo, so that there is no catastrophe like in the past. Now I am going to again see the Lama. He was a great influence to me. And I was a student for six to seven months. Scientists argue that we have global warming, and I would like to know what the Lama thinks of this. Here, the blessings are not free. That is why Norbu prepared a hada, a silk scarf symbolizing purity, sincerity, and respect, and where he slipped in a banknote. I have heard that the scientists estimate that this lake, Lake Imja, is particularly dangerous. I think that in this lake there is a divinity. There are divinities in the entire Himalaya. People who have attained a certain wisdom, from them I hear that the people who live in the area think that it is best to leave nature alone. To undertake mechanical action, like draining or pumping, would be harmful. We would irritate the gods. Therefore, we must leave everything as is. Now, if there are people who want to ignore the teachings of the Lama, there is nothing we can do. According to the Buddhist religion, the totality of things, the mountain, the Himalayas, water, sky, air, everything is inhabited by the gods. If we dirty the sites, or if we do bad things, for example, if we commit incomprehensible acts, if we start conflicts between countries, if we start a war, then the gods would get angry. So, the gods... So yes, this is what the Lama says. The gods are angry because of men's acts. So the moments when the rain is supposed to fall, well, it doesn't. At the moment, we are supposed to have a harvest. There is no harvest and the snow doesn't fall like it's supposed to. So then, what can happen is that the ice will melt and we will have floods and we will be the victims. <laughs> Okay. 
Leaving the Lama to his domestic demons, Norbu takes his pilgrim stick and leaves alone to pursue the truth. He is divided between his own culture of karma, steeped in fatalism, and the urgency of the situation that needs a rapid intervention. For centuries, people have built stairway paths to link the villages. These thousands of steps are the only way to communicate. They are also carefully maintained as sacred construction, stupas and mani walls, which give rhythm to the region. For Norbu, walking is like chanting the mantras. Each step brings the walker a little higher in the relation between man and land. He treads with apparent slowness. During his trip to Kathmandu, Norbu noticed the impotence of the Nepalese authorities. He does not have a choice but to turn to a large source of hope, the young. This is it, the future of the Sherpa people, Sir Edmund Hillary thought when one of his climbing companions declared, our children have eyes, but they are blind. The climber understood what he must do, build a school. In this secondary class, lost in the middle of the Himalayas, global warming is not abstract. Our big brother Norbu is going to talk to us about global warming. He's welcome in this class, and right now I will give the floor to him. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Norbu Sherpa. In the 50s and 60s, all the glaciers in our Everest were covered in snow. For Norbu, testifying before the young awakening spirits is not a struggle. He has already done this type of interaction a dozen times before and he is always profoundly moved by the reaction of the public and the interesting questions he answers. What are the causes of global warming? What are the exact causes of the deep so lake rupturing? In your opinion, what are the possible solutions? What difficulties will the Nepalese encounter due to global warming? What have you lost because of the catastrophe? Did the Nepalese government help you? I lost almost 1,300,000 rupees at the time. Maybe a little more, I don't know. As for the government assistance, only the Red Cross gave me 300 rupees. <laughs> With the increase of temperatures, the consequence is that within two centuries, the Himalayas will completely lose their snow. There will be no more irrigation, and the grain basket of the southern plains will disappear. It is us, the Nepalese, who will suffer the most. It will begin with the Himalayan people, and then those of the average mountains, and finally with those of the Terai plains. All of these youngsters, they represent the future generation. If the same thing happens to them as it did to me, they will have to abandon their projects and live the same life as mine. It is important to give the villages information on global warming and on the possible consequences. We should integrate this new knowledge in all school curriculums. 
If we never want this to happen again, we must take the issue in hand. We also, in our region, but mainly you, the children of the country, can undertake scientific studies. And one day we can say that we, the Sherpas, we are glacial lake specialists. That is my wish. While waiting for the future generations to take over the country, Norbu can no longer hope that scientific and technical help from abroad can deliver them from the menace of Lake Imja. During his solitary journey along the path, his tears are there to remind him of the fragility of his world against the forces of nature. It is an abrupt transition to the Chu Kong Plateau. At 5,000 meters above sea level, it is the last inhabited zone of mountain. After, there is neither road, nor trail, nor stairs. Nothing but debris. This small village only operates for five months of the year during the tourist season. During the winter and monsoons, the danger of isolation is too great and no one is allowed to stay. Nima Sherpa created Everest Resort from scratch and she now runs it with the help of her young sons. Since the construction of her lodge, she learned that she was in a flood zone, right in the trajectory path of the wave if Lake Inja is to ever explode. Norbu hopes that she has accurate information to give him. How are you, boss? Good, good. What are you doing? Oh, well, I run the boutique. When I'm not busy, I can't man do. The scientists, in regard to all these disasters, did they give any suggestions? We have found that the level of Lake Imja does not stop rising. How do you know that? I know it. We went to see it. We climbed, we saw from the top that the water had risen. And the Japanese scientists? It seems that they installed something at the top. I heard someone say that it's sort of an alarm. Did you see it? Yes, I've heard talk of that. It was a question of cables or alarms, I think. But finally when we went, we saw nothing concrete. It was just a trial then? Yes, it was. For the scientific community, the glacial lakes are essentially beautiful study subjects to present to Congress. From the trials, only one lake has benefited from security improvements, Lake Cho Rolpa. In 2000, for example, we succeeded in lowering the level of the lake by three meters. We put in place a draining system and a system for alerting the public. It's a little old. We should change it or repair it soon. As for Lake Imja, all the necessary equipment is for pure research. In fact, the Netherlands financed the equipment of Lake Cholropa for $3 million. In a country where the average income per person is not more than $340 a year, that represents 10 times more than the whole population of the Khumbu Valley. The Netherlands withdrew, and Nepal could not follow. It is the moment that he has been waiting for and fears at the same time. He left at dawn. He needs to walk for several hours to get to the moraine, the lake, and the glacier.
I took the road from Gat at the bottom to get to the top where Imja Lake is. It has been a long time since I've been here, and it really is a special place. When I came here about 15 years ago, it was very different. There was grass that grew on the glacier. Now the vegetation has been replaced by rocks. This heap of land and ice it does not look very solid. I'm really scared here. The violence of the elements that have disrupted his life has been very strong, and Norbu can never erase this trauma. There are things that are unforgettable for us, and therefore harder. When we come here, it rises to the surface. It is not trivial, and it does not concern one single person. It has brought misfortune to a lot of people. We are very close to the Glacier Lakes Natural Dam. What we see here is the dam that prevents the lake from flowing. If this natural dam would break, nothing could stop the water from Imja Lake from escaping. It could collapse here to the right and it could break here to the left. If that's the case, water would be freed, take the slopes that we see here and slide down to the valley. If this dam was to break, it is not only the Kumbu Valley that will be affected, but it would probably go all the way to India. What Norbu hopes to find is signs of human intervention in this mineral desert of ice. Any equipment that would prove that something has been done to prevent the catastrophe. Lake Imja is still mainly frozen at a low level. To a casual observer, there is nothing menacing. Its bank, uncovered, shows neither the measuring instruments nor the warning device. In the months of July, August, it is a period where the lake begins to swell and the water comes up to my feet here. The water tunnels through the barrier below and destabilizes the moraines from underneath. That is very stressful.
About 15 or 16 years ago, a Japanese team did some research around the lake. I don't know what their conclusion was. In addition, there are other Nepalese teams that are conducting research. Therefore, there have been many things spoken to the right and to the left, but essentially nothing useful or concrete has been done. I really do not see the interest in climbing up here, if only in the end, to simply publish scientifically. The whole world tries to console us by telling us that one day the lake will be drained. We are told that, and then other things, but in the end, nothing is done. And so now, I would like to deliver a message. I will say to all developed countries, Continue to drive in your cars, build your factories, do a lot of things that, in the end, contribute to global warming. They have made a profit, but it is now us that suffer the consequences. So, there are some who live in comfort, but us, in the Himalayas, we are paying a big price for their good life.